Hi guys. So here we are. Um, this first video is going to cover the first page of topic 10. I actually already went over this material in class before the break, but since we're now scattered all over the world, I thought that it would be a good idea to do this again so that everyone's on the same page moving forward. Um, if you already have your notes for this, you can go ahead and skip to the second video, which will start on the second page of the topic 10 guided notes. All right, so um, let's get started. Section three is all about production. And what we're trying to do here is to understand where the supply curve comes from. How do firms decide how much to produce, how many workers to hire, how do we know how much profit they're gonna earn, when they might go out of business? All of those uh, are questions that we're gonna answer in the next couple lectures. So in an upper division course, we would start by defining a function, a mathematical function to describe the production process. We have Q is output, right? Quantity produced, A is some technology, and that's a, then we have a function of our input. And we've talked about inputs already. Um, we have lots and lots of different inputs into the production process. But we tend to, in economics, break down those inputs into four broad categories, just to help us think a little bit more carefully about different types of inputs. So those categories are land and natural resources, labor, that's workers, and capital. It's going to be everything from factories to computers to money to buy factories and computers. Right? Um, and then the last one is entrepreneurship. It's basically just the skills of workers, their drive, their innovation, all of those things that keep a business moving forward. All right, so we wanna think a little bit more carefully about these different types of inputs or just different inputs in general. And so to do that, um, I would like to have you watch a really short, like two minute video, less than two minutes about how Sriracha is made, okay? so that's posted um, in the lecture materials for this topic. So go ahead and pause this video, take a break, watch uh, how Sriracha is made, and then we're gonna write down, while you do that, as many of the inputs into making Sriracha as possible. All right, so um, from the video, um, we can see that we need ingredients, right? We need peppers, we need vinegar, salt, garlic, sugar. Okay, we need a factory, warehouses to store all those barrels, we need plastic bottles, and lots of different machinery um, and people to run that machinery. So we've got labor, we had trucks and grinders and all sorts of different types of um, equipment. Right, so here you can see, right, lots and lots of different types of specific inputs. We could break them down into these four broad categories, but actually what we're most interested in is to break them down by whether or not the input is fixed or variable. So what we mean by that is how does the input change with the scale of production? So a fixed input, it's fixed, doesn't change, okay? Does not change with the scale of production, how much we are producing. 
but a variable input is going to change depending on how much we produce. And we're going to use these fixed and variable terms, not just for inputs, but also for costs later on. So this is a really important distinction that we make. In the context of the Sriracha factory, let's go ahead and classify inputs as uh, either fixed or variable. Oops. So we'll highlight our fixed inputs here in yellow and our variable inputs in green. And um, the question that you want to ask yourself is, if you want to make more sriracha, say 100 extra bottles of sriracha, if you want to make 100 extra bottles of sriracha, what do you need more of? Okay, so clearly we need more ingredients, right? We need more peppers, more vinegar, okay, more garlic. We're gonna need more bottles. And we probably will need more labor or at least more hours of labor to produce that sriracha. But we're not necessarily gonna need a whole new factory, right? Or a second warehouse just to make 100 extra bottles of sriracha. Now, if we really wanted to increase scale a lot, we might need another factory. So it's not necessarily that one type of input would always be fixed or always be variable, but what we wanna think about is for small increases in production, is this something that you would um, need um, more of in order to increase the scale of production? All right, so I think factories, warehouses, storage barrels, trucks, and the equipment is probably fixed. All right, so now that you understand this distinction between fixed and variable inputs, we're going to go through an example with some numbers about a coffee shop and explore a little more how we might characterize production using numbers. So instead of a function to describe production, I'm gonna give you this table to describe production. And this table tells you the relationship between the inputs, okay? Here we have two inputs, baristas and espresso machines, and output, that's cappuccinos, okay? So, this table describes for any combination of inputs how much output I'm going to be producing. Now, you'll notice here we have these two inputs. We could think of labor generally, uh, sorry, as, of baristas generally as labor and the espresso makers, espresso machines, that would be capital. And typically in economics, we're going to assume that labor is variable and capital is fixed. And the reason for that is because it's more realistic, right? So if you're running a coffee shop, you probably have different numbers of people coming in on Tuesday and Saturday, and you might staff different numbers of workers to work Tuesday versus Saturday, but probably you have the same number of espresso machines on Tuesday as you do on Saturday, right? So in the short run, at least, it seems reasonable to assume that capital is fixed and labor is variable. And this is an assumption that we'll make throughout all of these problems. Okay, so we've got our production function, we've got labor and capital and some output. Now what we'd like to do is think a little bit more carefully about the marginal product of labor. Marginal product describes how much output is produced by each additional unit of an input. And in this case, we're always going to be talking about labor or variable input. 
So as I hire more workers, how many more cappuccinos does each worker produce? That's the question we're trying to answer. So if I have zero workers, I can't really calculate marginal product because no workers produce zero cappuccinos. Um, and so um, I'm really gonna just start here by thinking about the marginal product of the first worker. So as I hire the first worker, I go from zero to one workers. My output is increasing from zero to 180. And so the marginal product of the first worker is 180. If I hire the second worker, then my output increases from 180 to 320, which gives me a marginal product of 140. Hiring the second worker increases output by 140 cappuccinos. And we're gonna just do the same thing here as we move down the table, okay? Subtracting our total output from our previous total output to get the marginal product of each worker. Okay, so the fourth worker increases output from 420 to 480, which is 60 additional cappuccinos. All right, now what you'll notice here is that marginal product is decreasing, right? Marginal product is decreasing as I hire more workers. And that's an assumption that we actually always make in the context of production. And that is called diminishing marginal returns. It means that the more you produce, okay, the more expensive it becomes to produce it. In other words, the more of a variable input that I employ, the less productive that input becomes. Why is that? Why? Ah. Well, in the context of our coffee shop, this makes sense. If you only have two espresso machines, then eventually those espresso machines will get crowded as you hire more and more workers. This is true actually for any production process. As the variable input increases, fixed inputs become crowded. So we will always expect to see diminishing marginal returns or decreasing marginal product whenever we have any type of production process because we will always have some fixed inputs and some variable inputs and as we increase production the fixed inputs will become crowded. Okay, so the last thing that we want to do on this page is to try to understand a little bit better what our production function looks like. Uh, and on the next page as well, we're also going to try to understand what our cost functions look like. And that's because I'm really trying to help you draw the connection between the table problems here and graph problems, because I will be giving you graphs of cost curves and I will be giving you tables, and they're really exactly the same problem, just presented in two different ways, but sometimes it's hard to see that from the outset. All right, so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna graph total product on one graph, and then we're gonna graph marginal product on the other graph. So these obviously have different numbers. Um, so when I'm graphing total product, I'm gonna go ahead and label my y-axis by hundreds. And then just looking here at my table, I can see, oops, I can see that if I have zero workers, I produce no output. If I have one worker, I produce 180. And this does not need to be precise here. We're just trying to get a sense of the general shape of this line, okay, 480 and 500. And so 
if I go ahead and, and connect these dots, which is really very incorrect because the table problem is discrete and here I'm making it continuous, but the point here is to try to help you visualize what this might look like, what this type of function might look like um, as a graph. If I just go ahead and connect these dots, then um, what you've got here is this function that's increasing, right? As I add more workers, I get more coffee but it's increasing at a decreasing rate, right? It's becoming flatter as we go on. The slope is getting smaller. And actually the marginal product is the slope of the production function. And for those of you who've had calculus, you'll recognize that this formula here, change in quantity over change in uh, our input, right? that could be the derivative of the production function with respect to labor, okay? And that's how we would do this in, um, in the upper level classes. Okay, but for now, we're really kind of just interested in what's happening to our marginal product of labor here. What does that look like? So I'm gonna go ahead and label this axis by 50s. And then plot my marginal product of labor. <clears throat> okay, so one, it's 182, 140, 100, 60, and all right, so if I go ahead and connect these dots, again, that's, you know, mathematically makes your head hurt, but um, just to get a sense of what this looks like, what you can see is that your marginal product is decreasing, right? The, we knew that already. The more workers I hire, the lower, uh, the less output each additional worker will produce. Okay, another way of saying that is that the slope of the production function is decreasing with labor. Okay, okay, all of this to say that we always assume this decreasing marginal product or diminishing returns to scale as one property of our production function. On the next page, we're going to start talking about costs, which will be really the most important part of this topic, but understanding these fixed and variable inputs and marginal product will help you understand the cost concepts. All right, so good, first video. Um, let me know if you have questions, please utilize the discussion forums and I'll see you in the next video.